You're listening to Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, and I am your host, Olivia Fierro, and you know what time it is, right? It is mystery and thriller season, my favorite genres of books, and for a podcast that's already all about books, why not dig into a mystery that is literally a literary mystery about books and the craft of writing a good book, Uh, the quirky, cerebral world of writers who are, you know, trying to come up with a perfect story and all of the uh, suspicions and thoughts that they bring to the table um, when especially something unusual happens. So the mystery begins with a scream that pierces through the quiet of the Boston Public Library. And luckily, the author is here in our Phoenix studio to join us to talk about it. So Laurie Gentle is the author of the award-winning series, Roland Sinclair, uh, but is in our Phoenix studio to talk about our standalone, The Woman in the Library. This is a highly buzzed about book, and we're so fortunate to have you so far away from home. Um, So welcome, and thank you so much for coming in. Oh, thank you for having me, Olivia. It's a pleasure. Congratulations. And first of all, I mean, everybody loves the accent. I know this, right? So, I mean, when, when you come to visit the U.S., anybody who's from Australia, I feel like you're automatically the most popular person anybody's going to encounter. Oh, well, that's really nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk a lot. Oh, yes. Talk, talk, talk a lot. Uh, yeah, there's some accents that are, eh, you know, but th- this one is just, it's so appealing. And I know that you have spent a lot of time in the U.S. over the years, including as part of a group of writers who had the opportunity to come over and at least do a little work or research here in the United States. And that kind of was a little bit of an inspiration for this book, right? Uh, Yeah, no, that was um, 2019 was the last time I was in the States. So just before the world changed. Mm -hmm. um, And I was touring with three other mystery writers. And uh, we toured all the way up the West Coast. Um, So that was, I mean, a story in itself for mystery writers in a car. Uh, wandering around a country getting lost. The possibilities are limitless. Uh, yeah. did, did all four make it home alive? We we did. Okay, we, that's good. We're pretty sure that we did a head count at the end. Of the <laughs> <laughs> it's good when it's just a small group. Four. I mean, 14, we would not be able to necessarily guarantee everybody uh, survives, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and look, it was amazing we all survived considering how easily lost (laughs) all four of us um, are are liable to get. And also because, you know, we were, uh, well, this one of us, Jock Sarong, was doing all the driving and he's driving on the wrong side of the road. Oh, Lord. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) You know, in a giant car that uh, that could take the four of us and all our luggage um, as we traversed through the States. And we were not ready for things like L.A. traffic. Um, so it was an adventure in itself. I was born in LA County and I'm still never ready for LA traffic. <laughs> it is a, oh, an overwhelming beast all on its own and, and, uh, certainly a, a thriller or, or something scary, uh, <laughs> as scary as anything we'll read in the pages of a really, uh, good book. So please do set the scene for the listener here. I, I feel that this is a book everybody has at least heard about. I mean, it really has gotten a lot of attention. So congratulations. Thank you. And so happy that you're now back in the States to be able to promote it. And you're going to be um, spending some time at the Poison Pen in Scottsdale, signing books, and also um, doing some writer's workshops. Yes. So uh, this, I'll be doing a, a historical fiction and a crime fiction workshop um, and uh, also signing uh, the hardcovers at the Poison Pen so this week. So I've got a lot of uh, a lot of sessions at the Poison Pen this week. And then from there I go on to Chicago and Boston and New York and Washington, I think. Will um, you so be spending time in the Boston Public Library reading room? I will. I, I have... <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of tempted to run in there, scream. Totally. You must. Somebody must. Pay some, pay some like, out-of-work actor who's trying to get a SAG card to, like, run in there and do that for you. Yeah, that, that seems that seems appropriate, don't you think? But I have a fear that someone will get arrested if we do that. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, when you're, in, when you're in from out of the country, you just don't want to get arrested in yeah. a foreign land, right? Yeah, even yeah. if even if the intention is literary drama. Yes. It, it would be awkward <laughs> to explain to 
a court. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so please do. We we start with the scream. Tell us who our four main characters are and what what unfolds as we enter into your novel. Okay, so the, so the novel has an unusual structure, as you know. It's really a novel within a novel. Um, so the... Uh, the book opens with a letter and the letter is addressed to Hannah who is an Australian writer. It's written by uh, Leo who appears to be her greatest fan and her friend Uh, and Leo is in the beginning everything any writer could want from a fan. He's kind and he's considerate and he's so admiring of her work. He's even willing to do research for her Uh, but as the book progresses and you see more of Leo's letters you start to realise there's something a little bit dark Mm -hmm. about old Leo. Um, For one thing, he seems to know a lot about murder, which can be handy for a crime writer, but is (laughs) awkward in a friend. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. So, and the other part of the book is, as you mentioned, um, the story that Hannah is writing in response to the research and the advice that Leo sends her. And that that story opens in the reading room of the Boston Public Library where a young writer called Winifred Freddie, uh, who has just recently al- arrived from Australia, is sitting trying to begin her very worthy first novel. Um, and she's procrastinating a little bit and looking uh, at the three people who happen to be sharing the table with her and kind of imagining backstories and who they might be and what might have Uh, brought them to the library that day when a a terrible, horrifying, mortal scream rings out through the reading room and everybody stops everything they're doing um, and security comes in and tells everyone to stay where they are while they investigate, but nothing's found. It's almost as if the scream came out of nowhere and disappeared into nowhere. Um, but of course, it's a mystery, so of course it didn't. <laughs> and, and so the story is around uh, Winifred and the three people who happen to be at that uh, table with her. Uh, Wit Metters, who is a, a Harvard Law student trying desperately to fail law <laughs> so that he doesn't have to become a lawyer. Uh, uh, a, this, um, a young or a writer um, named... I try and remember everybody's name. <laughs> Sorry, his uh, there's his name is Kane. Um, yes, Kane. Oh gosh, is he handsome chin? Yeah, Wait, handsome, no, no, handsome face. Handsome face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this so handsome she, face and strong yeah. chin. So there's ha- handsome face and strong chin, or heroic uh, chin. Heroic yes. chin. Heroic chin. So because uh, when uh, Winifred is first um, uh, this looking at these char- uh, people, that she's thinking of them as characters, and she doesn't know their names, so she's giving them these funny little monikers so she can remember yes. as she's writing. So wit meta, she rem- this uh, names heroic chin. Yes. Um, Kane, she names, and oh gosh, I've forgotten his last name. It's there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we got it right here. It's, yes, it's yes, it's right yes. here mm-hmm. in the book. Uh, Kane's uh, there's uh, Kane. She calls handsome man because mm-hmm. he's a very handsome young man. He, it turns out that he's also a writer. Um, and then uh, this also sitting beside her is a young woman called uh, Marigold Anastas, who she mm-hmm. initially calls Freud Girl because she happens to be reading a volume of Freud. Mm-hmm. Um, and those uh, those three characters and Freddie make up the sort of the Scooby Gang at the centre mm-hmm. of Hannah's story, uh, who investigate this scream and try to find out what was the cause of it. Mm-hmm. And eventually, it turns out that a young woman has been killed at the library. And and they investigate um, who might have killed her. Mm-hmm. So what what you do so well is envelop the reader in this story within a story so that uh, at times, and I'm sure you've heard this before because I'm like, am I an idiot or what? Because there's you're, you're kind of losing track as you're getting caught up in what's happening as to what's real and what's not, what's being written as a potential novel, as a, as a member of this writing program, and what we're actually, as the outside reader, ingesting and following in terms of actual events mm. and feelings, and et cetera, and crime and danger and, and on and on. So um, it, give me more detail into how you framed who the narrators are. Okay, so um, 
you you have it, the, the, because the, the the letter structure that begins. I'll, I'll give you a insight into where that came yeah. from, and that might give um, readers an idea of of how this book works. Um, I I was writing an entirely different book, uh, also set in uh, Boston, uh, but at the time I'd ne- I'd never been to Boston, um, so the last thing I wanted to do was write a book that didn't ring true yeah. to the locals. Um, I had a friend, an American writer, Larry, who happened to be in Boston at the time. So I emailed him and said, Larry, do you mind if I pick your brain while you're in Boston while, so that I can write this book? And, you know, he's a very generous man. He said, of course, anything you need, I can go look at things for you, etc." And that worked out brilliantly. Uh, but soon I realised that Larry's a much better researcher than I am. So he'd not only answer my questions, but he'd send me menus and maps and weather reports. Then he started taking photographs of the sidewalks so I could see how the snow plows pushed the snow up on them. And then one day there was a murder a couple of blocks from where he was staying. And uh, he thought, Solari's a mystery writer. She might be interested in what an American crime scene (laughs) looks like. So Uh he... So he took himself off down yes. to, the, to the crime scene after the body had been removed and he took footage of the crime scene. So I'm in Australia and I received this email from Larry and there's a little file attached. I open up the file and it's film of a, of a crime scene. And my husband happened to be sitting behind me at the time and he saw over my shoulder what was on my screen and he said, Gosh, I hope Larry isn't killing people so he can send you research. (laughs) (laughs) To make himself indispensable to you and your work. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. And look, I'm 99% sure he wasn't. Yeah, we can't say we can't say completely. We never know anybody entirely. Exactly. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he he wasn't actually (laughs) killing people. We hope. But it did strike me as a really excellent conceit on the novel. So that's that's where the whole notion of or the structure of the woman in the library came from well it's funny because it plays with sort of the um obviously he is an aspiring writer as well so he's also trying to kind of curry favor and hope that he's going to get some intro to an agent or a publisher or whatever um and and he's an ego stroker because everybody loves to think that that you have fans and people who really appreciate your work and think you're brilliant and all of that um but he puts the fan in fanatic kind of because it really kind of reminds you of how um, dangerous or sometimes uncomfortable that blurry line can be in relationships when somebody maybe knows your work or knows you in a public space and of course you you want to be gracious and welcoming and you generally like people and you're generally yep. curious about what other people have to say and you know whatever but then things can get a little bit weird. Yeah so that that, that line is always a, a hazy one. Um, I mean mo- most um People in the public eye and writers, certainly, and artists and so on, want to engage yeah. with the people who um, who consume their work. Um, and, and, and that is lovely. It's lovely to talk to someone who knows your work. But the difference is, I suppose, when you write a book, you are in someone's head for about 10 hours or mm-hmm. however long it takes them mm-hmm. to read the book. And that's kind of intimate to be oh, in yeah. their head. Mm-hmm. But you're not aware of it. Mm-hmm. They are. So they feel like they know you because you've been whispering to them mm-hmm. for 10 mm-hmm. hours. Mm-hmm. Um, but you don't know them. Mm-hmm. And so that's sometimes where the, the line can get very, very hazy. And in my experience, mostly readers are fantastic. I love talking to readers. You know, one in 500 becomes a little bit strange. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and you just have to worry because those people, you, uh, you, you're not aware that it's a little bit strange until you're too far in. Until it might be a little too late, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Exactly. So I, w- I wanted to talk about that relationship. And, and you know, part of, part of being a writer is you have to be open to people. You yeah. can't close yourself off from people. Um, because that You need to know how weird people are so that you can write interesting characters. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but you also need to be open to the human condition because we're all writing about mm-hmm. human relationships and people. Um, and so sometimes uh, you can go blithely into these relationships. 
relationships, thinking, oh, no, this is perfectly normal and uh, until it's way too late. And then when you look at it in hindsight, you think, mm, I should have twigged, you know, a month before that, uh-huh. uh, etc. But you don't <laughs> because you assume that most people are law abiding and not serial killers. <laughs> yes. We love to live under that assumption. It allows us to leave the house every day. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> with, with just only low levels of anxiety and not um, overwhelming anxiety or agoraphobia. Exactly. Um, so, okay. So, so the, the Leo, the, the, the conversations um, and, and not, not to reveal too much, but they just become, I mean, really fantastically weird and, and, and increasingly more so. And you're like, what well, is that? He becomes that very controlling. He, he suddenly takes ownership of her book. Of her work and her creativity. And so yes. she's, so the relationship is to, to, to set it up, she is giving him chapters as she's going on yep. to get some feedback. So and he's he like is, a running beta reader. He's reading yeah. as she goes, just to make sure. And because she's writing from Australia and she's writing a book set in Boston, she wants to make sure as she's writing mm-hmm. that it rings through and it's authentic. Yeah. And he does a lot of reasonable research and he gives a lot of really good feedback colloquialisms that wouldn't be said in the u.s or in boston and things like that yeah Mm -hmm. what places look like yeah but the it he gives her also structural feedback on what characters should be doing (laughs) and uh very and takes a great offense when when they're not immediately implemented absolutely yes yes (laughs) and and you do you 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 do have that with some um beta readers and uh uh, i'm sure the writers amongst your audience will will have had that experience Uh uh-huh uh, where where someone you know gives you feedback and feedback is a very valuable thing for a writer, um, uh, especially when they're in the process of creating the piece. Uh, but you know, there's always that element of control in yeah. There. <laughs> is that is that something that comes up with editors or with like close you know uh, confidants like a, a spouse or whomever that you're really letting read things early on? Uh, not not often for okay. me. My, my husband is my first editor, but uh-huh. uh, he knows that I ignore him. Yeah, I want to. <laughs> that's you know part of, part of the marriage yeah. contract. That's 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 yeah. it. Yeah, um, those are the rules. So um, so that that that's all fine. But every now and then you have a. Uh, a fan or, or someone who gets hold of your book and they give you feedback mm-hmm. and they're really, really invested. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's lovely that they're invested. There's a whole stack of um, readers who will send you uh, feedback on commas and punctuation oh, and uh-huh. editing and they will do it. And it's lovely that they do that. Um, but uh, Less lovely out when it's published and out in the world. Well, and, I, yeah. I just I just sort of forward those things on to my publisher right. so for the next editions they can <laughs> they can fix it if they want uh-huh. uh huh. but a lot of those things are sort of but 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 things like structural edits of what characters do sure. that's really the choice of the writer <laughs> <laughs> no it's your book is that what you're trying to tell me solari it's your book you get to decide what happens absolutely and, oh. and people have different people always have to di- you know that that's that's the sign of a good book where you want a character to do something uh-huh where you want them to survive or you want them to come out well or you want them to uh make uh such and such a decision and there's a fine line between wanting that and telling the writer and demanding it we just had a book club conversation with alex finley last night about the night shift and so it was unlike here on the podcast where we're very careful no spoilers i'm always um hoping that you'll be listening to this if you have read the book or that this will make you go out and get the book that we're talking about but that was a okay we've all read this book so you know here we are talking about it and it was about three of the readers said why did you let fill in the blank, die. Why did you let that happen? I'm so upset with you. And it was and it was funny because this is ultimately that's very successful because you're caring about somebody and yeah, something excellent. happened and you're feeling something. So, you know. Yeah, writers don't want to discourage that ever. <laughs> um, I have, you know, with the Roland Sinclair mysteries, I have readers who write to me after every single book telling me that I'm too hard on Roland. Oh, uh-huh. And please stop beating him up and please stop <laughs> shooting him and please stop stabbing him. Um, and and, and, you know, I can only write back and say, look, he's a he's a crime fiction hero. That's mm-hmm. part of the gig. Yeah. You know, he knew what he was signing up for. Uh, but, uh, and, and I think it's lovely when people really care that much that they will actually sit down and write a letter to oh, the writer. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's, that's really heartwarming mm-hmm. to know that you've reached people that that much. Um, but, again, as I said, there is sometimes that line uh, where you go from being a really – caring valued reader yeah to being 
an insane person. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lisa Jewell said it well. It was some sort of analogy, like telling me some kind of something about I should have done X, Y, or Z with my book after it's already out in the world is sort of like something to do with like the, the, the chicken that's already been delivered for you to eat. Like we can't yeah. we can't save that chicken in the coop anymore. Like yeah. it's already out, you yeah, know? Yeah, like, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> like it's dinner and let's move on. <laughs> it's okay. happened. So, so Leo gets it. And you know, it's funny when I, when I gave this book out to other friends to read before it was published, um, there was a real difference between the friends who were writers uh-huh. and the ones who weren't. The ones who weren't thought that Leo was really lovely and were really surprised when things started to oh, turn. Mm-hmm. The writers hated him from uh-huh. page one because uh-huh. he was telling her what to do. Uh-huh. Well, and he was also <laughs> angling for something and it was so obvious. obvious yeah. And there was like he oozed desperation yeah. and he was, ne- you know, a needy and, and whatever. And so, um, yeah, he had yeah. my ch- up right away. <laughs> well, you know, I, I kind of... I'm a bit uh, sympathetic or a bit um, tolerant of that desperation because, uh-huh. you know, in um, in writing there are a lot of people who have wonderful manuscripts who who haven't yet been published. Yes, and I know that, and I know that sometimes be in this game, uh, being a published writer and being a successful published writer has a lot to do with luck as mm-hmm. well. You know, the stars have to align mm-hmm. for you. Um, and it can sometimes feel to people, I think, like there's a club of published writers and we're not letting anyone else uh-huh. in. Um, so I, I sometimes get those sort of letters from people who are desperate to find a way yeah. in. Uh, and I am understanding Yeah, that. they want to crack the code. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. It feels like there's a key that someone else has and they're not being given mm-hmm. that key and I understand that feeling and I'm sympathetic to it um, so I try to be understanding mm-hmm. when, when uh, you get that so I think I'm probably a little bit understanding of Leo's desperation mm-hmm. to be published and him trying to um, get Hannah to help him and I, I think she probably would be understanding of that as well mm-hmm. it's where he starts demanding mm-hmm. the man mm-hmm. and that, that's always the line with writers mm-hmm. when you start telling us what to write mm-hmm. that's when our backs get oh up. yeah that's where you've crossed the line yeah okay so so this this book has i mean it could be described it's like meta it's there there's this going on inside of this inside of this mm-hmm. and so uh the the characters that she's writing sort of well there is maybe less overlap in the less overlap in the real world than than sometimes I was feeling that there was because we are losing we, we sort of lose ourselves in the what's the reality and what's the fiction inside this work of fiction so it, it is very clever and exciting for people who love books there are two Leos correct there's two Leos. <laughs> there's, there's Leo her co- the correspondent yes. her friend who's helping her and then she creates a character who she names Leo as a kind of a a homage or a, a yeah a, to him um, and, and, you know, writers do that all the time. Huh. You know, people, for some reason, always want to be the dead body or want to be the criminal. <laughs> and in, in Australia in particular, most crime writers um, auction uh, yes. names in their books for charity. So um, if you want to be featured in the next book, you'll, you'll buy a, a raffle ticket. Mm-hmm. And, um, and if you win, then your name will become... You know the villain's name or the one of the yes. victims' names, that sort of thing. So, uh, so this it seemed to me that you know Hannah would do that, okay, uh, because he was helping her out. It's one. It's almost like an acknowledgement of the people who help you in a book. Okay, you give a character their name. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, and so Leo, the character originally is l- is lovely. He's charming. He's also a writer. He's a he's a romance writer. Or, um, and he has this his wonderful belief that every book is really a work of romance, um, no matter what you choose to call it. Um, and and he lives in the same building as Winifred, and he's helpful and useful. Um, but of course, as Hannah comes to know more about Leo, um, the character Leo starts to change to reflect how she's feeling about the real person. <laughs> It is. It, it's so good because it just gives your mind. It's like um, 
a brain exercise. You know, we are we are fending off um, any early onset dementia because you're <laughs> exercising. You're exercising your reader brain. You really need to be like actively in in. Oh, it. I'm going to put that on the front of the book. <laughs> you know, read I this mean, to fend off dementia. I'm not a doctor, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty solid statement. You can go with it. Go with it. Go with it in print. Um, it, it, it is it, so so. Originally, you go you go visit the United States. So that were you already working on this book when you came and did this U.S. trip? No, 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 no. no, no. This no. is all since. Okay, so I was working on this book during um, the Australian bushfires. Okay, so I live in a little town that was caught in the middle of the bushfires. It was uh, evacuated and uh, it was deemed undefendable, and so I had to. When we had to leave, all I could oh. take was a laptop. Oh. and my husband and my son are both volunteer firefighters so they were up on the front fighting the fire and so I was sitting in this little uh, refugee house uh, in the neighboring town with nothing but my laptop um, and I started writing this book um, so it was so the the fires do eke into this book yes as does, mm -hmm. um, as does the pandemic mm -hmm. um, not in a huge way but mm -hmm. this it it's just the whole outside because it's meta fiction mm -hmm. uh, which is you know writing about writing the whole uh, environment in which you write tends to seep in mm -hmm. uh, to the story just a little. Mm -hmm. And that has been an interesting decision that it seems every author I've spoken to recently kind of had to grapple with on their own is the pandemic that has loomed over everybody's lives. And, and, and some of us are like, okay, we're so sick of it, we don't want it mentioned. Yeah, some absolutely. find it like, impossible not to every emotion that they've had recently that's going to feel real is framed by it yeah. so it is a it is a tough choice many books set in 2019 right now that are coming out because then at least you don't have to deal with it yeah yeah well look I, and and that was the you know at the time i was writing this book that was the argument because um of course beginning of 2020 i was writing it through the pandemic the argument in australia or the the discussion amongst writers is what do we do yeah uh, and there were some writers who <laughs> were just about to put out books and all of a sudden the pan and there were it was contemporary fiction and all of a sudden the pandemic came along and changed the world and they were trying to retrofish the pandemic mm -hmm. into their story which is very very difficult mm -hmm. um, and as you said there were writers who just said no we'll turn readers away by doing that nobody mm -hmm. wants to read about it mm -hmm. uh, we'll set our book in 2019 but we cannot all set our books in 2019 <laughs> forever we can't <laughs> it's just not yeah um, and so I think uh the, that I mean, that argument is actually embodied in the book. Yes. Between yeah. Hannah and Leo. Leo, who's saying to her, you can't write a contemporary, a work of contemporary fiction without mentioning the pandemic. Right. Write in the masks. Yeah. Mention this. Say yeah. this. Do this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, Hannah is very resistant to mm -hmm. that whole idea. And, and I can understand that too, because it kidnaps the narrative. Once mm -hmm. you write the pandemic mm -hmm. into a narrative, the book becomes about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and so she didn't want that. That was not the story she was telling um so in some ways i i got it i got the pandemic in sneakily by writing it and not writing it yeah uh, which is and, and i suppose that's how writers are going to handle it we're going to come up with creative ways of dealing with the pandemic in our work that uh prevents it kidnapping the story yes if we don't want it to kidnap the story. Mm -hmm. um, Unless it's germane to the plot point of, you know, yeah. a, a psychological drama because people are stuck together or because they've relocated because of this or... Yeah, but it but it still acknowledges uh, the fact that it happened. And you don't want to, white, um, to just whitewash it and leave it out because... You know, people people suffered, people died, people changed, the world changed. Yeah. And in some ways ignoring it is a little bit of a little bit of the easy path and mm -hmm. it's a little bit cowardly. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't want to do that either. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is it is a it is a difficult thing for writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also an interesting the big issues that were happening at this time period, of course, you know, coming out of that at, at the peak of the pandemic, of course, and there's incredible racial tensions and, and yeah. demonstrations and protests and a lot of uh, pain and grief experienced in particular in the United States. Yeah. Um, and you're as an Australian writer, that sort of 
th- that tension of, of what to do about that as well. Yes. Sort of you, you do acknowledge it and you do allow it in in these communications between her uh, yes. ad- a friendly advisor, quote unquote, in the United yes. States. Well, you know, in, in a lot of ways that was um, easier for me because the fact that I was writing to Larry through all of this. Yes, okay. Um, and we were having conversations of that kind mm-hmm. uh, about what was going on in the States. And in in a funny sort of way, sometimes when you're in the middle of something, it's harder to observe it than if you're removed. Mm-hmm. So I'm watching it from Australia with this um, kind of removal, I think, mm-hmm. um, and and still writing to Larry, who's right in the centre of mm-hmm. it. Um, and I, I found that really interesting. Uh, and I, I don't know, I'm, I suppose most Americans realise what an effect America has on the rest of the world and how much we follow your current events. So, I mean, I don't think America cares less about what's going on in Australia, uh, politically or uh, socially, and... You know, this that's perfectly understandable. We're a, a small country in terms of population and influence. But what happens in America has a big impact on the rest of the world. So we follow it very closely. So we were following uh, all those developments. We were following your elections. We were following uh, the Black Lives Matters m- movement. And that had, you know, uh, that spouted or uh, that germinated those yeah. similar sort of movements in Australia. Um, so... All of that was really important to that period. It wasn't just about the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, and and then the funny and this is exactly what I mean about the pandemic kill, killing the story. If people talk about twenty twenty, they think pandemic, but twenty twenty had so, so much, much more, so much, um, and so much that I think will have uh, much more lasting effects and changes to the world. Mm-hmm. But people think pandemic, mm-hmm. um, so. It's, you know, it probably illustrates more than anything how a story can be kidnapped by it. Um, And I I suppose I think it's a responsibility of writers to try and find a way to deal with that, to pick through that, to to try in our work um, to give give the spotlight and time and light to things that matter as well as acknowledging that we all went through this experience Mm -hmm. together as a world Mm -hmm. Um, and we are emerging Mm -hmm. I would say I wouldn't say it's over but we're emerging Mm -hmm. it's uh it's an interesting way to explore something that is sensitive because as Hannah is sort of pushing back in particular. So uh, an example, which which doesn't doesn't ruin anything in the book, is, is some of the conversations is about um, that in the United States we would need to be, as an American reader, this Leo guy wants her very much to identify uh, the racial makeup of all of our characters. That's right. And feels it's preposterous, um, unfathomable that we could uh, tell a story, understand a story about four people who we know have these academics in, in, in common. We know they have this at least temporary geography in common. We know that there's a sexual chemistry they've got in common. They've got a lot of things in common. Um, but he is is fixed on the idea that we cannot know people or understand dynamics between people if we don't know what race they are and if yeah. they're of different races of each other. Yes. And so I wonder if that is uh, sort of like a kind of a commentary on how many ma- Americans focus on uh, race and color is that something that seems different in Australia? Is that something that seems like more American than it's elsewhere? It's, I think it's it is different in Australia. Uh, I I wouldn't say that we're um, it's it's hard. I I don't like using the word racist, but race doesn't play as big a part in Australia yeah. as it does in America. Um, I, I know Larry finds that Australians are more casually racist than Americans. Mm-hmm. We're a lot less polite, so we'll say things. Mm-hmm. And we will use colloquialisms that are inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But the difference is there doesn't seem to be that element of real hate there. Um, so people use these colloquialisms without thinking. Mm-hmm. It's not because they're actually um, trying to put people down. Um, so the casual racism is certainly there in Australia. Mm-hmm. That, that that exists and it is upsetting and it's something that people are working on. Um, I haven't, and, and uh, so I suppose um, uh, I'm a woman of colour, I'm a writer of colour, I've, I've grown up in Australia. Um, 
and I have not, in my experience, experience seen any of that real division or hate mm-hmm. or exclusion mm-hmm. that goes on. That doesn't mean it doesn't of exist. Of course, yeah. Uh, because I also recognise that I come uh, from a privileged position of being an educated uh, person from a sort of a middle class background. Um, so that may change mm-hmm. um, depending on your circumstances. Uh, but it's... Uh, it is. It it seems to be less of a um, uh, an issue, well, not an issue, but a less of a, um, a salient point yeah. in Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly in Australia, as writers, we don't really think about identifying mm-hmm. characters by colour. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't occur to us. Well, and it's one of the things that I like about books the most. I mean, you. It, it's one of the things that when when a book that we enjoy. Uh, goes to television or movie, we're like, wait a second, that's not it. That's not who I pictured at all. That's not yeah. what I pictured at all. And it's like an affront yeah. to our own creative minds because what's beautiful about a book is that we get to see it how we want to see yep. it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, the, you know, there is also a default to white that yeah. occurs uh-huh. out of Western mm-hmm. literature. So it tends to be that if you're not told that a character is a person of colour, the assumption is, that yes. they're white. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's no reason for that. Mm-hmm. And I'm aware of that and I don't necessarily think that that default to white is a racist thing Mm -hmm. it's just something that's come out of years and years and years of western literature being about white people sure Mm -hmm. um because the value of representation now is is exactly exactly so I can understand all the arguments for identifying color Mm -hmm. it's um and I can also I understand all the arguments for not yeah um what I think that the novel does as a as a entity uh, or, a, or a thing is it's in the best position to have conversations with the reader uh, and conversations in the privacy of their own mind so they can be really honest about what they feel and they think. So I don't think that it's ever um, valuable for a writer to preach at a reader. Uh, it's not valuable to lecture to a reader because they just turn off but if you can start the conversation and get readers thinking about what they think and what their prejudices might be or what their defaults might be and why that is then they can have that conversation in complete private without fear of judgment and you might get some real conversation and some real persuasion and maybe um, some real uh, movement yeah. in, in where people stand uh, in that process. So that's what I try to do with my books. I don't want to preach at people, bleat at people, um, tell people what to think, but I would love to know that people start to think when they read my books. Yeah. I mean, that that's the power, right? Is yeah. putting, taking somebody someplace else, putting them in somebody else's experience, um, whatever that may look like or however they're digesting it and feeling something that they wouldn't have felt before. Yeah. yeah. And if, if, you know, if readers read this book and they think, Oh yeah, I am assuming that all these mm-hmm. people are white. Why do I do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if if they say, well, actually, if that guy is not white, I don't like him as much. Uh-huh. Why? That is a lot yeah. more useful than me saying you're a bad person. Right. Yeah. Just that awareness. <laughs> that awareness yeah. is yeah. very. Oh wow, that's yeah. a that's yeah. an evaluation that you may not have made of yourself as as a reader, exactly. as a consumer of entertainment before. And the, and the only people that can change people are themselves, mm-hmm. um, and they will do that with awareness and with with knowledge, as opposed to anyone telling them what to yeah. do or think. And uh, as you can see, with the way Hannah reacted, yeah. being told what to write and to think <laughs> and to do is not something that any human being likes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you must feel so satisfied to put out something that uh, feels like this, that's so smart and that can stimulate so much conversation. Um, so so to be able to kind of go out and, and start meeting with people who have read it and also to be sharing your craft. So you clearly, as is evidence in this fiction, you love the craft of writing. So what does it look like when you are doing these writing workshops? Like, uh, are those for for people who are already sophisticated writers? Are they already working on storytelling? Or, I mean, where where does one begin? Because I think that especially as a reader who loves books, we, we elevate writers to, you know, kind of that magical yeah. place where they've got a gift that is just untouchable. And it was, you know, God's gift that was bestowed <laughs> upon them. And boom, all of a sudden we've got this. And so, you know, where do you begin if, you know? Well, look, I don't know if we deserve 
<laughs> that kind of elevation. Pull the uh, curtain back. <laughs> Let me know what it's really like. So I, um, I tend to think that every writer has their own way. Yeah. Um, and has their own path. And I don't know that you can actually teach someone how to write. But what you can do is you can show them, give them an insight into what you do and what you found worked so that they can maybe try that for themselves mm-hmm. and decide whether they like it or not. Sometimes knowing how you don't want to do things is as important mm-hmm. as knowing how you want to do things. So what I tend to do in workshops is to talk to writers about how they think uh, they'd want to write and maybe throw in a few suggestions of what else might work mm-hmm. and what to do if they're stuck or how, how I'd approach it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it is about discussing again Mm -hmm. um so in in a similar way um i suppose my mantra is i don't like to tell people what to do Mm -hmm. uh but that's so weird because i love to tell people what to do (laughs) (laughs) we don't have that in common (laughs) uh, yeah i probably use you for a workshop uh but you know it's just about uh, suggesting and 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 sharing techniques um and there's things that you learn um, in the business and and through the publication industry uh, about things that work with writing and things that work with framing and 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 things that work with motivation. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is motivation. I mean, I, I know I've done workshops for years and uh, there's some faces I see again and again and again because there's people out there who just like doing workshops. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't necessarily... Um, well, they might say they want to write a novel, but I, I don't know whether they actually want to write, mm-hmm. write a novel. They just enjoy the workshops, which is fine mm-hmm. uh, because it's an opportunity to meet other writers and to talk and to discuss literature mm-hmm. uh, at, a, at a sort of a different level, at a more um, structural level than you would as a reader. Uh, but then uh, there are other people who have this fantastic idea for a book and they, they just don't know how to put that onto the page. And that's... Uh, where a writer's workshop can be really helpful because it can give you ideas on on how that could fall onto the page. Is that going to be a mystery or is Mm -hmm. it a more literary novel or is there a strong romance in the Mm -hmm. centre? My experience from when I started writing, Mm -hmm. I I lived in a small country town and when you're talking about a small Australian country town, a thousand people. Uh, And so until I was published, I'd never met a writer at all. I had no idea. So... Some to, and, and, and I remember in those days, sometimes all I wanted to do, I would have paid people to just to listen to me talk about the book because I just wanted to talk to someone. Yeah. Um, and I think that... And kind of work things work things yeah. out in the way that it, yeah. it sounds and, and that just sort yeah. of is just helpful. Talk to, yeah, talk to someone and say, this is what I think. Does that sound sane? Mm-hmm. Does that sound interesting? Mm-hmm. Um, and that sort of, you know, very basic level feedback. And sometimes when you vocalise what you're thinking, that's when you... That's when your ideas take form. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, I like to... I like for workshops to be places where people can come out with ideas and talk and and get that start um with what they're doing um and uh and perhaps you know i can give them some sort of way to structure it Mm -hmm. uh, or some sort of idea on how they could structure it that could turn it into a novel Mm -hmm. um of course there's other people who are more established writers and they're coming to you because they have an actual problem Mm -hmm. with the manuscript they're working on that's very targeted and quite you know um and not necessarily easy, but it's it's targeted to to respond to because you know exactly what the problem is, mm-hmm. and you can give them some suggestions mm-hmm. uh, on how that works, uh, or or how they may uh, climb out of it. And then there's some people who uh, have a motivation problem. They'll come in. They say they'll say, "Look, you know, I've been working on this novel for 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and you know, I'm stuck at." Chapter six. <laughs> <laughs> I have been there since 1989, and I don't know. I just, I don't know. Well, the world keeps changing. And, <laughs> now yeah. I got to update the first five chapters, which is a burden. Yeah, yeah, yeah mm. exactly. And 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 sometimes you, you know, sometimes uh, you can say to people, and sometimes you can see. Uh, because again, people get really caught up inside their manuscript, mm-hmm. and sometimes p- someone outside can see exactly what the problem is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there have been writers who've come to me and they're working on something and they're really caught up in it, and you see that they're just writing the wrong story. That there's a, a sort of a side story in their novel that is the story they should be writing, 
because it's the one that has life and it's and when they talk about it you can see it in their eyes that that's what they're really interested in but for some reason they think they're writing a memoir about grandma and you know they this they've got to stay true to the memoir and it's the little side story about grandma's dog that's really going to capture <laughs> <laughs> uh, capture their imagination. So, so quite often uh, you can you can help people that way. Um, but yeah, I, I just you know I just like talking to people, and and I'm quite uh, this. I, I like to be available to people where they have questions because the funny thing about the publication industry is it's mysterious. Yeah. And even you know this, especially when you're outside the before you're published, it's this mysterious thing that you don't know how things work exactly and who does what and so on. Um, and so I've always had a policy of whatever you ask me, I'll answer honestly. Uh, and you can ask me anything in 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 the context of writing life because I have been there where I didn't know and I had no one to ask. Yeah. Oh, that is so fantastic. That must be, feel very satisfying. And I'm sure anybody who was able to uh, encounter you and have these dialogues with you is, is walking away f all for the better. Whether it comes out in a book or not, uh, they're yeah. feeling better. <laughs> they're feeling better. They're feeling heard and kind of stimulated because your joy for writing uh, definitely comes through. And, and you're obviously a brilliantly talented uh, storyteller. So I, I, I'm over hogging your time I know that so uh, well, I, I also help you put off dementia as you mentioned so I mean she's, <laughs> she's saving lives I mean one <laughs> one complex story at a time so thank you uh so Laurie Gentle the book is the woman in the library and of course you have a series of books also um for people to be digging into all of your work and I imagine you're going to have uh, yet another one to come soon right yes yes so um it's there's another one coming out in spring of 2024 was the last date they gave me all right Right. Well, yeah. please enjoy all of your time in the United States. Welcome uh, back to, to Phoenix and Scottsdale. And it was so nice to have you here. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me, Olivia. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, and they will be signed copies of The Woman in the Library at the Poison Pen in Scottsdale. If you want to add that to your collection, I know you do. So happy reading. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music. This is Olivia's Book Club, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.